let's go ahead and begin our nerdy review on Gundam Thunderbolt, or Mobile Suit Gundam Thunderbolt. Now, for those of you who don't know, Mobile Suit Gundam Thunderbolt is a ONA, or O-N-A, which is a original net animation. I actually did not know that terminology, actually, until I had to look it up, uh, specifically for this particular series. I always had thought, because when I, my familiarity with Thunderbolt was that it was a manga turned into a movie. I didn't realize it was a manga turned into a net series, and then turned into these two movies, which are compilations of the net series. Um, good news... I, I, I mean, depending on how you want to look at it, um, the compilation of these movies actually cover majority of what's in the series themselves, so we're not really missing out a whole lot. Math wrong here. Sorry. Hour 10, hour 20. I am, I'm off with myself. But I want to give you that kind of context of what we're, we're going to be going into when it comes to uh, Gundam Thunderbolt. Now, it's broken up into those two movies, like I mentioned. The first one you can see on the screen here, too, is December Sky. I don't have a screenshot of it. But then there's also the second movie, which is Gundam, um, it's a, sorry, Thunderbolt, uh, Bandit Flower. So just to give you an idea of the synopsis of the story, so with December Sky, December Sky, takes place at the very tail end of the war here. Uh, we focus mostly on, you know, Federation Xeon forces fighting at side four. Particularly, we're following the ace pilots of EO Fleming, who is this gentleman, this spiky gentleman right here. And then we follow on Zeon side Daryl Lorenz, who is this uh, Afro fellow over here. And as they clash it out and duke it out and duel it out, quite literally, in the uh, end of the one year war. So that's pretty much the first movie itself. The second movie, which unfortunately I do not have a cover for right now, but I'll show you the little cover right here, uh, takes place literally right after or right at the end of um, of the first series. Let me just enlarge that for you. There we go. I should have got, got it on the screen cap, but that's okay. Uh, but uh, takes place right at the end of December Sky, where it leaves off because it has a little cliffhanger, right? Uh, takes place right after that, and then it time skips eight months after the One Year War, where we basically follow mostly um, EO and the Federation, alongside with Daryl and the Xeon uh, Remnants, not Xeon specifically, but Xeon Remnants, in the search for the Psycho Zaku's data, which happens to be in the hands of a cult by the name of the South Seas Alliance. I think it's a little bit funky right there. The... It doesn't seem like there's a whole lot going on because there isn't really a whole lot going on. Um, I, I don't, I don't want to jump right into that port, but I want to jump into some of like the cooler aspects that I really digged about the movies themselves. And first and foremost, I want to talk about is the animation. If you even just look like right over here, that's the primary animation you're really looking at. Some of these are actually looking pretty good within the series, uh, the movie itself, just not as f uh, fluid or flux like it is. So the big the big thing between this is that the animation style is very very like stark and like heavy on the inking. A lot of this anim like this uh characterization reminds me a lot of things I've seen like in JoJo's Bizarre Adventure for an example. A lot of these like heavy inking, a lot of these like very masculine type of uh, features and really, really drawn out, stark and contrasty, um, darker colors kind of thing. A lot different than what you would normally see in other Gundam series where it's a lot lighter in tone for color-wise and animation. So it's a, it's a really welcoming thing. Um, the mechs, the mechs are kind of like a little, it feels like a little bit of CGI, but not truly not. It's a big di difference between like Origin and then this one right here. So it feels more like a fluid animation and it just, it's a wonder to watch. <laughs> it's a... Uh, I don't want to describe it. It's not like Speed Racer, like, eye melty sometimes, but it can get to those levels. The other thing I really, really liked about this series, too, is the dubbing. Dubbing on this one, usually, like, you know, I've always talked about a lot of the early 90s, the 2000s Gundam dubbing is, like, the, the prime one right there. The dubbing in this in this movie set is actually not that bad. I really really like it. Um, particularly, I'm like I, I spotted out uh, Daryl's voice the moment I heard it. It was Johnny Young Bosch. I 
Now, I don't know if a lot of people know uh, know of this voice actor or care for him, but I love him as Vash the Stampede from Trigun. So I'm like, as soon as I heard his voice, I'm like, oh, that's Johnny right there. I recognize him. Like, okay. And then everybody else, like Eo's voice, uh, to Carla's. And Claudia, I mean, everyone sounds great. They are they fit within their role. It's just, everything gelled so well with the voice acting. The whole cast overall gels so well with the movies. So great job. I, I can't complain about that there. Um, I have not watched this in Japanese. I reviewed, I watched them. This is my second time watching both of them. And both times I've only watched it in English. Yeah, I'm like, well, Zaki, you could watch it in Japanese. Like, mm, I don't like reading as much. Much. I'm sorry, but um, I, I would probably say that, you know, I, I never doubt that the Japanese voice acting would ever sound that bad. You, a lot of them, a lot of times Japanese voice acting sounds great, has a lot of emotion, but um, if I'm going to have to pick between English or Japanese, I'm always going to pick English unless it's really, really bad. Like, 1980s Giver bad. Not the movie. I'm not talking about the movie. I'm talking about the actual manga, uh, manga, uh, Manga Company uh, dubbing of Giver. Really. Um, so that's that's some things I want to talk about. Just kind of like both of the movies overall now. I just want to talk about each of the movies in particular because they're... Quickest thing I could say about them is that it is a night and day difference between the two. So let me break it down. December Sky. Man, that is a fun, action-packed, non-stop thrill right for the most part. It is a flurry of music and destruction. That, that's the best way I can sum up that movie in, like, quick words. Um, I've already given you the story on December Sky, but basically, like, there's not a whole lot of plot going on in this story. Mostly just Federation versus Zeon at the end of the war, and then we're just following our two main protagonists, antagonists in the story. I think they share equal amount of screen time. I think it's a little bit more heavy on Io's side. Or EO side is like I O is his name. So it's like EO I O. I think it's EO. If I'm not correct. If I'm not, if I'm saying it correctly. And it it's feels more like his movie. And I say it this way because this movie is mostly dominated by the music and the action. Um, introduces a lot of like this bebop type jazz. I don't know. I don't. I'm not a music person. So forgive me if I'm this saying this, but it's more so like um, like music you would hear from cowboy bebop, but turn like crank it to eleven. And it's intense, it's crazy, it's action-y kind of jazzy music. And most of that, it's it's a character, not character said, but a characterization. So most of this like bebop action-y jazz comes from EO. Or I uh, EO for the most part. Not most part, but it is his music. Whenever we get these scenes with like Daryl or focusing on Daryl for the most part, his m music mostly focuses more like kind of like that smooth jazz slash soft or somber arm but it focuses mostly like on that stuff right there so you get very contrasting music and then when they get into their little duels or fights it really becomes that clash of music it's like a clash of the bands kind of a thing so it's a very different feel but much of this movie is really dominated by the music. It's what kind of, I feel, is what's the pushing force. It's not so much the story that's pushing the movie, it's the music. And the music is very uh, tonal. Very, very tonal, very, very thematic, or thematic at points too. A lot of EO's music, it's hot and fiery, and even at points just angry. Um, and you can kind of get that a little bit in the story, not by a whole lot, like how EO's upset about... Uh, his father and what's going on with Claudia and those sort of things. And then when you get to Daryl stuff, it's very much that somber, like soft, uh, soft R and B type music or, you know, smooth kind of jazzy music. And you get more of that, you know, that tone with him because he's just that calm, collect, um, remorseful almost about, you know, what's going on with him. He is a, um, I would say paraplegic, and then he becomes quadparaplegic. If I'm, if I'm using my terminologies here correctly, medically, um, not too, uh, kind of a spoiler, I guess, but um, in the movie itself. So it's like you kind of get the somberness with him um, and his relation with Carla, too. Um, 
his wanting or longing to be normal again or trying to fit or find purpose, repurposing himself too. So I think it's like a lot of the music kind of like controls a lot of this plot narrative. We're not getting a whole lot by the actual story itself, oddly. And I feel like the, the narrative is the narrative is really more controlled by the music. And this is a very unique thing for a Gundam series. I've never seen anything like in Gundam where the music is really the controller of the story, not the characters or the story slash plot line itself, but the music. So a lot of it is driven by, the, again, that fiery, hot jazz and soft, somber R&B. And that's what we get a lot from this series or this particular movie itself. Um, like I was talking about, too, there's it. It doesn't seem like it visually. You can get more of a sense of it like in an audible sense, but the plot line is very, very paper thin. Character development, yes, we do see some semblance of it, but honestly, it's more, it's kind of like passerby kind of situations. It is a compilation film, so I don't know how much between the Ona series was taken into the movie itself. From what I read about, though, after watching the movie the second time around and trying to get like an idea, trying to do a comparison, right? From what I understand, majority of the Ona series was transported into this movie, so it was compact. There's only eight episodes of the Ona. Four episodes were compiled into this one hour and ten minute movie. So it seems about right if every episode's about 20 minutes or so, give or take, not including opening and ending credits, right? Sounds about right. Maybe like 10 minutes was shaved off at best. Two, four, 60, one hour, and then an hour 20, so 10 minutes has to be shaved off. I actually don't know how long the series is on on the uh, when it was originally released, so I don't know. But if everything's condensed down, not really condensed down, so far from what I can understand, even if it's 10 minutes of scenes cut out, there's not a whole lot of character development. And that's another issue, too, is that when we're trying to get an idea about the plot, right, a lot of it doesn't, like, a lot of things don't make sense at certain points. Like, we can kind of get a little more of an understanding between, like, uh, Daryl and Carla's relationship. And then, you know, how uh, Eo and Car uh, Claudia's relationship is, too. Um, but it's not really well-defined. We kind of got, like, ideas. There's a lot of exposition at times. But we don't really get much of a strong semblance or an idea of that. Additionally, there's other things that don't make sense. And here's another spoiler, so I'm going to give you like that like little three, two, one, zero. Spoiler warning here, guys. Watch out. Um, so it makes no sense in the movie why there's another character by the name of Grant. If I remember right, he was a uh, a CO. I can't remember what he was. Not, not a captain, though. But for whatever the reason, he shoots Carla. And to me, it didn't make any sense. I'm like, I understand he had resentment towards her, but there wasn't enough of this resentment to really establish why he would even go as far as to shoot her. Um, a lot of the things that like transpired through the events didn't quite make a lot of sense or how it was put together. Again, it's super paper thin with this plot, with the character development. Most of this movie is driven by the by the action and then over heavy handed driven by the by the music of this entire movie which brings me to my next point here and um i'm just gonna just kind of like put it up right here for you guys just so you can you know kind of see it a little bit here for uh bandit flower so now we're uh december sky was very actiony controlled by the music very paper thin plot line bandit flower is the opposite but I'm going to say opposite for all the wrong reasons, though. Sometimes, like, opposite's a good thing, right? Like, in this case here, like, I, I prefer to have a series that's more, a little slower paced at times. I, I do enjoy my action movies and stuff like that, but I want something a little bit slower paced, especially when it comes to Gundam. I want slower paced, I want characters, I want story. Bandit Flower tries to do this, but absolutely fails. It's a much slower paced. I would almost say, like, it's, you could almost say that these two movies... This is EO's movie, and this is Daryl's movie. If you want to consider, like, like music-wise, right? But, um... How do I put this? Like, it's a very slow pace. The sad thing about Bandit Flower here is that it's a much a slower-paced film. A lot of music is not as jazzy or crazy. It feels more so with that, um... 
somber, calm music that Daryl has in the first movie. And that mostly orients this entire film. Um, and it tries to focus more on the characters and on a plot. But again, just like the first movie, it's very paper thin with the plot, paper thin with the characters. It tries to make certain explanations for certain characters, but it doesn't go full way. So it's kind of like, like a half explanation of them. And it feels very much so like a very lazy, like half, half attempt on trying to create a solid story out of it. Honestly, you couldn't figure out what was really going on with the plot. I mean, you kind of you kind of get the idea of what they were doing, but it doesn't feel like it was a strong enough plot. It felt, felt like almost a MacGuffin almost. Um, where both sides, the Federation and Xeon, are looking for the uh, data from the Psycho Zaku. And that's pretty much it. That, 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 that was the driving force. It didn't feel like it, though, because they didn't really make it seem like a big deal up until, like, the last 30 minutes of the movie, and that's where it was the biggest deal of them all. I'm like, oh, okay, I thought that the, this was, like, a starter point, and then we're going to go off to something else. It was, like, kind of the beginning MacGuffin, and then we're going to get to something else. But no, it was the MacGuffin throughout the entire film, and that was it. Uh, we are introduced a couple of new characters here and they're okay. I mean, we, we, we get like a jazz, a little jazz band session with, uh, EO and I, I forgot her new, her, the new character's name already. Um, uh, actually, let me see if I can see it from back here. Nope. They don't even, they barely even mention EO and Daryl. It's mostly talking about Daryl. So it's like, oh yeah, it's putting, putting it out. It's Daryl's story, really. Um... And then, yeah, that, that that's just pretty much it with this movie here. It it was a slower paced, calmer, tries to tell a story, but it, it goes in so many different directions, so many different ways with a paper thin plot that it already had. It was just poking holes at itself. Like we kind of jump back uh, with Carla for a little bit and it's not really, I mean, what's the point? when they really didn't dive into anything else. We dive into some more things about Eo, which is great, but then Daryl gets completely left out with, with whatever character uh, po uh, points that he has as himself. And I, I just could not get behind Bandit Flower. There is some action in there. There are some cool mechs, some, not by a whole lot, in here too. But honestly, it just felt like it felt fl it fell flat. The biggest crime that both of these movies commit is something I've talked about in the past. They do a cliffhanger at the ending. So at the ending of Thunderbolt or December Sky, I'm sorry. At the end of December Sky, they kind of did a th they did a cliffhanger. I'm like, okay, that's fine because I know there's a sequel, right? Sequel takes place and it's like one of those cliffhangers where it's like it's a huge build up, right? I'm like, oh my gosh, what's going to happen? Starts off the movie with the cliffhanger, and then, like, they didn't really do anything special, and then they time skip. Then what's the point of a cliffhanger that you leave off so amazing, so awesome, right? Ask so many questions, and you kind of kind of wonder what's going to happen. Don't even bother with it. Okay. Well, then, we get the Bandit Flower, and I'm like, okay, cool, I'm trying to get into this. It's really, really hard. Don't care too much for the characters at the moment here, or... What's going on with the development doesn't make a lot, like, not a whole lot of sense because of the pacing of the movie and how it's going. And then we get to the ending and it becomes another cliffhanger. The sad thing about this, though, is that this is capsizing the last f episodes four to eight. And the Ona has not picked up another set of series because the manga apparently has, like, another two more volumes or so, which could be easily another two more series, like, two more sets of Ona episodes, or like four or eight more episodes, or two more movies. But right now, there's no plans to make a sequel to this so far. So all we get is these two movies, which were super fun, action-packed, boring and doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Both of them have light, paper-thin plot lines. It was just okay for the most part, you know? And now it leaves off on a cliffhanger that we're never going to see a sequel too. I hate those kind of things. I want to have some kind of conclusion. So I'm just going to have to end, like, you know, just make up what happened at the end of Bandit, uh, Bandit Flower, you know, just, or what happens next, I guess. So that's not a whole lot of good right there. It just 
eh, it irks me, it pisses me off. I don't, I don't know how else to put it in the most blunt way possible. Um, that being said, though, I do want to jump into this next little fun part um, you guys are kind of familiar with me talking about is talking about the suits. Um, like I mentioned before, and you know, um, when it comes to every Gundam series, there is always a new set of suits introduced, new mech designs, or redesigns of something previously. So, you know, Gundam Thunderbolt is nothing special. It was a manga brought into a series, brought into a movie. Um, and I thought it had some, some neat designs. Uh, one thing I do want to mention, though, that kind of ticked me off about it, too, is that it's kind of like the same thing what Unicorn does and um, what Origin does, too. I don't mind when we go back in time and we tell a story about the one-year war. I hate when we keep on trying to update it and try to introduce all this new tech. So by the time you watch the original, like, if you watch the original Gundam and you watch something like December Sky, for example, you're going to go like, why is December Sky, like, so advanced? It's kind of like Star Wars watching Episode 4, and then you go watch Episode 1, you see all this advanced technology, and I'm like, what just happened here? Did, did, did they just get upgraded in the past and they downgraded in the future? What, what's going on here? So I, I thought that was kind of frustrating, but it's, it's not that it's a bad thing, though. There were some kind of cool things, like seeing the GMs having these extra arms with the shields and stuff. Like, I mean, it's cool, cool thing. I, I think it was neat and all. I just didn't think it was appropriate during the one-year war because, like, we didn't really see this stuff. And that many GMs that are fitted like this? As far as I remember when it comes to the one-year war, the Federation was finally pumping out GMs like crazy, but they were just making regular stock GMs, you know? Just so they can shove pilots in there and their little iron cassets, uh, casket, uh, cassets and send them off to their doom just so they can fight for a cause like maintain power. That was it. It kind of baffles me when I see like newer tech and stuff like that in in these newer movie slash series. It kind of throws me off. But it's not that I don't appreciate the designs. I still think they're kind of cool though. Uh, but the biggest one I really really liked though was finally incorporating because this Gundam has been more of a mobile suit variation or like um, a suit that's been only seen like in comic books like or like you know like in um magazines like as a design but not really so much as an actual story so it's i think it's great to finally see the full armor rx-78 gundam or i said rx but full armor 78 uh gundam in display here and actually it's redone too uh i don't think i can find the original one let me try and see if i can pull you guys up the original one Ah, here we go. This is the original full armor Gundam. This has never really been seen. It's more of a mobile suit variation, like I said, which is um, basically a collection of artwork slash designs from the designers of the series, like the mech designers of the series, and they create, you know, like what they think is going to be like, you know, the next suit. So we have the original one, which kind of looks kind of lame and um, okay one from the original Gundam, right? And then this is what Thunderbolt does to it. And it just it just gives it steroids and go and like go out and have fun. I think like we still keep a lot of the similar features that we see from the original, such as the shield with the double barrel um um uh make a particle cannons, are that's what they are. Let me double check what they are again. I do apologize. This is a twin beam rifle. Okay. So a twin beam rifle, and this one should be still a twin beam rifle as well. Just want to be, you know, corrected here. Yeah, twin beam rifle right here. Additional armor. Yeah, so we got the twin beam rifle still here. It's still heavily armored, just like it is in the original one right here. It's just reinforced armor on it. But then we also get a lot of things that are in the Thunderbolt series. So, like, you know, these extender, like, extending arms that hold onto the shields. You got some additional weaponry for this Gundam and propellants, too. It's kind of cool, like... In the movie, so you do see it drop down from what it does have. So, like, you can see at its most bare bones. Like, it looks like an okay design. I think it looks really, really ugly without the extra armor. It looks like like a weird, weird blocky version of the original Gundam. But it still works out, though. I mean, like, I, I really do appreciate this redesign of the full armor Gundam. 
I also have to give a shout out to the um, the MSO six R Zaku two, which is the Psycho Zaku. I thought this was kind of weird because like when I looked at the name, I'm like, it's got an R, so it's the same thing as the R series, right? And technically it is, but the one I was misthinking of, and it, and it even mentions right here, is the R dash one, which was this one right here. This is the one I was thinking that it was basically a. This is another MSV suit. Um, I'm mostly more familiar with it because of the games. But I thought that that's what this suit was, just redesigned, right? Because when I heard that it was has an R, I'm like, oh, it's the redesigned version of it. Nope. It's actually uh, re-redesigned. It's, it's within the series itself, a redesigned suit, a redesigned version of the R1 um, to be a, a better high mobility type, incorporating all the positives and taking out all the negatives. Just like another suit I'll be talking about eventually. Not in this review, though. <laughs> But I really do love the design of the Psycho Zaku. It gets a little bit kind of crazier with like some of the at additional attachments to it and stuff like that. Uh, let me see if you can see it again here. You can kind of see it, not by a whole lot. You can see like the double uh, bazookas, but it had this huge thing. You can barely even see it in this uh, shouting right here. But uh, it's a it's a great design. I, I really love and enjoy the, um, the MSA6R Psycho Zaku design alongside with the full armor. Though. Next thing I want to talk about is the, um, if I am new to Gundam, is this, a, is this something I should watch first? I'm going to say this in the light, the politest way possible. No, do not watch Gundam Thunderbolt, either December Skies and especially not, um, Bandit Flower as your first Gundam series. Yes, December Sky is a fun, fast paced, actiony, like, music driven Gundam movie, right? But it doesn't fit well into the overall like look into the Gundam franchise itself. Especially with Bandit Flower where it tries to do what the like other Gundam series does but falls completely flat, flat on its face because of its paper thin plot and character development. Um it, it just kills your entry into it. so if you watch this and you're like, oh man, this is what I'm gonna expect from Gundam and then you jump into another series like Zeta Gundam or even the original Gundam. And you can go like, this is not what I signed up for. Um, I would easily tell you, like, if you want something action-packed, like, this is a really action-packed uh, movie for the first one with December Sky. So I would recommend that if, like, you really, really want action-based stuff, I think you're going to appreciate uh, December Sky more than anything else. But leave it alone after that. Don't even jump into Bandit Flower. But... Don't expect all other Gundam series to be like that. You might as well just jump from that point, go to G Gundam or Gundam Seed, maybe, or um, I would even hazard um, Iron Blooded Orphans for an example. Maybe not so much, but like that's another another take too. But it's too action packy compared to every other Gundam series that you can see. It's very contrasting. Or you know, I would say if you want to start off in the One Year War because this you know December Sky takes place in the One Year War, then jump into uh, Eighth MS Team far more superior in terms of storytelling and it still has while well, the action's lighter compared to uh, December Sky's action it is still a little bit more consistent and it it manages to tell a well-balanced story alongside with its action rather than being so action and music heavy and then you know plot slash character driven all the way at the very bottom you know so that's what I have to say about that one definitely avoid these movies if, if it's your first time jumping into the Gundam franchise I would say definitely check out at least December Sky. It's worth a watch. It's fun. I really, really enjoyed it. Which brings me to my final points over here. So, overall, when it comes to Gundam Thunderbolt, again, December Sky is an incredible ride with action and music that's akin to, like, a Clash of the Bands Gundam style, right? But the paper-thin plot of both of the movies and then Bandit Flowers poor attempt at trying to tell story and character development alongside with that abrupt slow down in the pace of the storytelling and the movie overall kills this entire series. In fact, it it's so polar about these two movies. I'm going to give you two separate uh, scores alongside with the series overall. So check it out. Mobile Suit Gundam Thunderbolt. December Sky gets a 4 out of 5. However, Mobile Suit Gundam Thunderbolt Bandit Flower gets a 2 out of 5. But wait, there's more! 
As for Mobile Suit Gundam Thunderbolt, the compilation movies, it gets a solid 3 out of 5. I don't know what else to say about these movies. Um, they're very polar opposites. It feels very much so like the characters of EO and Daryl themselves. EO controlling December Sky and Daryl controlling Bandit Flower. But at the same time, both of them dominate the movies within their own screen times, which is funny. EO had more screen time, or EO's music had more time frame, like, like domination in December Sky, but we focus more so on both characters. I feel a little bit more on Daryl. And then, then Bandit Flower, we are focused more so on EO, but a lot of the music is Daryl's type of music. So, I don't know what to say about that, but I think it's just kind of funny how polar opposite these movies are and how it drastically impacted the overall score. Definitely, if you had a chance, check out December Sky. I highly recommend December Sky. It was a fun action movie. Just treat it as an action movie, and you won't be disappointed. You come in there as a Gundam fan like myself... You're going to be like I, I can hear other Gundam fans going like they're disappointed with this storyline because it was very mediocre. It was OK. Right. But the action, the action is there. The fun in watching that was there. Then you watch Bandit Flower and you're like, what am I watching? What is this garbage? And especially when it's supposed to take place after the one year war where we don't have a whole lot of stories after the one year war. It really didn't add anything to offer to be honest it was its own little side, weird side story that went off on a tangent that didn't fit within the, the realm of post one year war so that's all I have to say regarding Mobile Suit Gundam Thunderbolt um, glad I got a chance to rewatch it a, a second time around too again I really enjoyed um, December Sky not so much so about um, Bandit Flower I will keep trashing Bandit Flower but we are now, at this current point in time, out of the One Year War. December Sky ending at the end of the One Year War, and then Bandit Flower continuing eight months after. Even though we didn't really go a whole lot of anywhere with that eight months, we are now outside of the One Year War. We have now completed every single series release, again, in Japan and North America, regarding the One Year War. Um, actually, that's a little bit of a fib here, because there's... Um, Gundam Evolved, but I don't really count that exactly, but majority of the series, movies, OVAs, ONAs are now covered. We are now leaving, exiting stage right, or sorry, stage right of the uh, One Year War, and we are now moving on to post-war stuff. <laughs> 